Poetry, Loss and Resilience. Brought to you by the Vermont Poetry Center in partnership with Mill Valley Library. I'm your host, Dave Setter, MPC's Social Media Director. MPC gives thanks to our members who make these events possible. If you're not already a member, please join us and help build bridges through poetry while enjoying special member benefits. Details can be found at marinpoetrycenter.org. Also find on our website details about upcoming events, including our members reading series known as the Summer Traveling Show, which will take place on Zoom this year. For tonight's event, chat will be open where our readers' bios will be posted and where you may leave appreciative comments. Any questions you may have for tonight's presenters can be entered in the Q&A section. Both chat and Q&A are located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. MPC begins tonight's event by acknowledging we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and its ancestors past, present and emerging. Tonight's reading falls within the field of eco-poetics, defined in part by the Poetry Foundation as a multidisciplinary approach that includes poetics, science, and theory, as well as emphasizing innovative approaches common to conceptual poetry. And here's my favorite part, eco-poetics is not quite nature poetry. The roots of eco-poetry run deep. Through the centuries, poets have acted as witnesses to environmental harm. John Clare in his poem, The Fallen Elm, addresses both the ecological and social cost of privatization of the common heath in 19th century England in the lines, the rabbit had not where to make his den and labor's only cow was drove away. Poetry by cultivating the imagination supplements science. Camille Dungy's Trophic Cascade takes its title from and gives life to a scientific term. Her poem describes the revitalization of mountain ecology following the reintroduction of the gray wolf to Yellowstone National Park. Dungy sees the cycle of new life through the lens of her own motherhood in the lines don't you tell me this is not the same as my story. All this life born from one hungry animal, this whole new landscape. But now we come to California. Tonight, we explore two recent eco-poetry anthologies, California Fire and Water, a climate crisis anthology edited by Molly Fisk and Fire and Rain, Eco-Poetry of California, edited by Lucille Langday and Ruth Nolan. We're very grateful to the editors for joining us tonight, who will speak about their anthologies, followed by a reading by eco-poets whose works appear in the anthologies. So first up will be Molly Fisk. Molly Fisk edited California Fire and Water, a climate crisis anthology with a Poets Laureate Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets. She's the author of The More Difficult Beauty, Listening to Winter, and Houston, We Have a Possum, among other books. Fisk lives in the Sierra Foothills where she teaches writing to cancer patients provides weekly commentary to community radio and works as a radical life coach. Please join me in welcoming Molly, who will now tell us about her anthology. Molly, take it away. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, and thank you to Amanda and Franklin, all three of you for running this reading tonight. And the Marin Poetry Center, where I was a board member for five years, and the Mill Valley Public Library, where I did all my studying in high school. California Fire and Water, a climate crisis anthology. Looks like this. The light in here is crazy. Um, 
It contains 145 poems written by Californians from ages eight to 85. It's the culmination, as Dave said, of the project I did with a Poets Laureate Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets that was designed to help us face uncertainty and express our personal responses to the climate crisis. My thanks to California Poets in the Schools for teaching climate crisis modules in classrooms nationwide and to the Mellon Foundation for funding this fellowship. The third year of the fellowship was just announced today, so you can look that up online and see which people in the country, including many Californians, are gonna be doing new projects. The book provides solace and resilience, as well as describing personal experiences with climate crisis. And it's a great way to show people from out of the reach of our Western landscape, what living under the threats of wildfire and flooding feels like. It's being used in classrooms in California and beyond. Percentages of the book's sales go to produce copies to give California public prison, and school libraries, and are donated to the Nisanan tribe on whose unceded land I live and work. Thank you so much for joining us tonight in support of libraries, poetry, climate crisis awareness, and general survival. Thank you, Molly. Next up to talk about their anthology will be Lucille Langday and Ruth Nolan. Lucille Langday and Ruth Nolan are co-editors of the anthology Fire and Rain, Eco-Poetry of California. Lucille is also the author of 11 poetry collections, most recently Birds of San Pancho and other poems of place. Her many honors include the Blue Light Poetry Prize, two Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Awards, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award, and 11 Pushcart Prize nominations. She is the founder and publisher of Scarlet Tanager Books. Ruth is the newly designated Mojave Desert Literary Laureate. Nolan writes about wildfire, environmental issues, and life in the Mojave and Coachella Valley deserts. Her work has been published in News from Native California, McSweeney's, Desert Oracle, Women's Studies Quarterly, and Landia Literary Journeys, and many other journals. A former wildland firefighter, she is professor of English at College of the Desert. Lucille and Ruth, welcome. Please tell us about your anthology. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Um, like Molly, I'd also like to say thank you to Amanda and Franklin, the Marin Poetry Center, and the Mill Valley Library for hosting this event. And also, I want to say thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us here tonight. Um, Ten years ago, I got the idea for this anthology. This is what it looks like. Um, it's called Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, and I started gathering the poems for it way back in 2011. Um, having trained as a biologist, I knew about global war warming back then, as well as the many other ecological problems California is facing. Um, but I have to say that everything, especially climate change, has become more urgent in the intervening years. Although I started work on this book in 2011, I needed Ruth Nolan as my co-editor in order to bring it to fruition. The book came out in 2018, and it was my partnership with Ruth that made it possible. Uh, the book is organized into eight sections by bioregion. Um, for example, there are sections on the coast and ocean, the redwood forests and the desert. Ruth and I called the book Fire and Rain because fire and rain are so important in shaping California ecosystems. As it turns out, fire has a good and normal role to play in shaping California ecosystems. There were wildfires here, started primarily by lightning, but also by volcanoes long before there were people. And many California species uh, have adapted 
to endure and survive fires. Uh, now, however, due to human activities and climate change, things have gotten completely out of hand. And last year, California had its worst fire season ever. Um, in addition though, to pointing out problems, Fire and Rain celebrates the beauty and diversity of California ecosystems. And to help preserve these ecosystems, Ruth and I are giving all of the profits from the anthology to seven environmental organizations. So now we'll hear from Ruth. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I'd also like to thank our hosts and everybody who's worked to make this evening possible. Um, I'm weighing in from the California desert. It's always exciting to be in readings. We have so many Northern Californian people because we are just so much lesser served with organizations and type groups that help promote what we're doing down here. So it's very easy to feel pretty isolated down here. I would like to make an acknowledgement from the desert of the unceded lands of the Kawea and Shamwebi and other tribes who are still living here and serving and caring for the land, their homeland here in this area. I am very honored to be part of Fire and Rain and was it's been quite a journey with Lucy and we've been doing a lot of readings and literally last summer during the extreme isolation in the desert of the pandemic, I was staying at a friend's cabin up in Joshua Tree and we were choking on wildfire smoke and I had specifically gone there to do some writing and try to get a little bit of inspiration and I was just sort of had this idea that maybe it would be fun to do some readings with Lucy for fire and rain as a way to create connections and help braid the fabric of echo poetry and poetry and poets and literary people and all anybody who's interested as a way to create new ecologic connections as we're doing here on zoom to showcase our poems and not only that but even more fundamentally to help us build community and create new spaces during a time when not only were we all feeling so cut off from the world and isolated due to the pandemic but also being traumatized and in many cases displaced and enduring great losses from the major wildfires. And there's not a part of this state that hasn't been affected in what was happening last year. So just like a little bolt of lightning that was striking down and tried to light a fire, a little creative fire was lit. And so I ran the idea by Lucy and she just immediately said, you know, it'd be wonderful to reach out to Molly and see if she would like to maybe form a collaborative reading between the two anthologies and contributors. So we did that and Molly was wonderfully, and I'm so grateful, receptive to the idea of doing some readings together. And our first two readings were last fall. And we did one that was SoCal centric, another one, Northern California centric. And I just feel that the vehicle of these readings has given us a whole new way to connect with one another throughout the state and share the beauty and hardships and tragedies and recoveries and resilience, and most importantly, our relationship to the places we live and the spaces we inhabit, even as they're very quickly changing and altering around us in so many ways due to the effects of climate change. So um, just welcome to our reading. Very happy to have you all here and very much looking forward to hearing each of you read tonight. Great, thank you so much, Lucille and Ruth. And now we'll move on to the poetry reading portion of the program. Uh, we're going to hear from poets whose works appear in the anthologies. Each will read uh, for three minutes uh, or less and then introduce the next reader by name. We will post their bios in the chat where you can also leave appreciations. And as always, questions, uh, if you have any, can be placed in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So I'll introduce the first reader. And then we'll just take it on from there. So first up will be Katie Brown. Katie, are you there? Take it away. Okay. Hello. <laughs> it's, sound is now working. Um, it's thank you very much for um, your 
your attendance this evening in this reading. Uh, special thanks again to the Marin Poetry Center and to the Mill Valley Public Library System for hosting this reading. Um, my poem is Remembering Water. Remember the world of water, emerald ponds, aqua seas, turquoise bays, opal falls. Remember the meadows alive with garter snakes and salamanders and the rain, gentle showers, steely downpours, virga that never reaches the ground. Remember the world alive with the sounds of water in motion. We will tell our grandchildren about this world on desert nights under an arid moon. And I have the privilege to read um, a poem by maybe the youngest poet who, um, who entered a poem in this anthology named Quinn Arthur who is a third grade student from Francis Scott Key Elementary School in San Francisco. If you want to follow along, Quinn's poem is on page 12. The heat against my face. If I were an owl, I would fly fast through the gray silky willow trees at dusk. I would watch the copper colored stream flow at sunrise. I would watch a fox hunt rabbits at midnight. I would soar through a river with drips of water passing my flapping wings. I would even fly through the burning fire and the sizzling sun with the heat against my face. The universe taught me this bravery. Our next poet is Gail. Entrican, I hope I said that right. Entrican, maybe. All right. Um, my poem is called Bad Children. Everywhere the planet is pulling in her generous green, folding it up forever in the vast trunk of history. She is taking down the curtains of rain and giving them away to someone in another dimension who will treat them gently. She is rolling up the atmosphere with its cigarette holes and much eaten diatribes. And when she has packed her bags and slammed the door and left us looking at each other in silent shame, like bad children, we will say, we didn't do it. It was someone else. The poem I wanna read um, by one of the children is uh, by Sophie Lee, it's called Secrets. And it's on page 103. Sophie's a fifth grader at West Portal Elementary School in San Francisco. The glistening white moon taught me how to sleep at night. The golden sun taught the world to rise during the bumpy dawn. The shaking forest has secrets to tell you. You are strong. Don't give up. You can make it through. Very prescient for, for a child in fifth grade, I thought. I'd also like to read, uh, Lucy was good enough to give me her okay on this, one of my poems from Fire and Rain. This is called Blue Whales. Blue whales are out there somewhere, 6,000 of the hundreds of thousands that once roamed the planet's seas. Now separated from each other by thousands of miles, they moan their loneliness, four octaves below middle sea, so low, so slow, we humans cannot even hear. But on our ocean liners and in our lighthouse kitchens, the cutlery jangles on the table, the glass pane vibrates in its frame, and we know something nearby is crying out in need. 2,000 miles away they can be heard and answered, the loudest sound made by a living thing, and we don't know what it says. But only that speed it up 10 times what we hear is a long, blue, unearthly note, a gurgle so deep we slip down into our own lostness, grateful that they are carrying for us something bigger than we could hold. 
And now I'd like to introduce my friend who's coming to us from Bali, Catherine Herrer. Thank you, Gail. Can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. Yes. My poem is on page 73 of California Fire and Water, and I want to also thank Molly for including me and for making this possible. Um, I was the director of California Poets in the Schools many, many years ago, and it was a big part of my life as a poet teacher. So now I teach community college. So here's my poem on page 73. It's called Impermanence. When the fire came to my house, it took everything but a copper bell. The flames swallowed its wooden tongue. My neighbor's Buddha didn't burn. It watched over the char, the vacant land, and skeleton trees, eyes half closed. Flesh of books, ligaments of tables and chairs, Mark's paintings. He died two years after they did. I knew then I couldn't belong to the pines, the oaks, and the madrones, sun smells of summer, long, dry evenings alone. Yesterday, we smelled a new fire as we drove in our unmelted cars hundreds of miles from the flames. In my tidy kitchen, I slide open a drawer, finger a neat pile of folded dish towels, sniff the air. And I am going to look for the, <laughs> the children's poem, the kid poem that, um, sorry, it's taking me a minute because I have to use my phone because I'm in Bali, <laughs> uh, that Molly sent me. Molly has been so fabulous. Okay, this is by Kathy Kwan. I'm not sure what page it's on because I don't see it here, but um, it's a lovely short poem. It's called Sun Sets. A little girl is standing outside the window. Go back to sleep, she will whisper in the dead of dawn. Walk out to school, watch them go back and forth. See the stars before they go away. Watch the sun before it sets. You can see a black and white raging through the land. Thank you. Okay, the next poet, I'm sorry for that little pause. I think being 15 hours away on a different day is making me a little uh, discombobulated. Uh, Jacqueline Holton is our next reader. Let's welcome Jacqueline. Hi, thank you. Thank you to Molly for selecting my poem for this book and working with California Poets in the Schools. I have also worked with California Poets in the Schools for several years until I had my own kid and kind of everything went out the window. So I just loved working with those kids. And I had, excuse me, <clears throat> edited a few of their anthologies and loved, loved, loved reading student poems and wading through these wonderful student poems. But I will start with my own poem, The Tree. It's on page 81. The Tree. They lived in my neighborhood. The fire wouldn't even come close. But there they were on TV cutting down the lone oak tree in their gravel-scaped front yard because the flames might leap from the branches to the shingled roof of their rented duplex. The woman spoke to the camera of their preventive industry while her grown son, sweating into a red bandana, sawed away at the regal oak. And some long forgotten anger smoldered inside me. I don't know why, 13 years later, I'm thinking about them. It wasn't even a eucalyptus, all parchment and oil like the one that shades my porch, the one that would more, most certainly go up before their thick oak took a light. But the fire never even jumped the highway. Today, the canyon's green from all the winter rain. My mother just left after staying with us for a week. I told my husband not to ask her, but of course he did. I really didn't want to know how she voted. I said that my friend Caroline reduced this whole mess to a handful of words. The Russians tricked the rednecks. And my, my mom winced a bit at that, the way I used to shrink when she picked me up from school in the old Monte Carlo with no right fender. On TV, a man's being dragged off a plane and the bombs we knew would drop are dropping now. 
There's a kernel of meanness in my heart today, a resurrected rage, though I can't trace back this thought to where it forked off to those yokels looking down at a pile of felled branches, their job half done. The handsaw wouldn't cut the trunk, but they knew a guy who'd loan them a power saw to bring down what was left of the tree. And the poem I'm going to read from the anthology is We Will Rise by Emily Macario, who is an 11th grader at Middletown High School in Lake County. We Will Rise. The smell of smoke burnt my lungs as I breathed in the night's fiery air. Ribbons of gray and black smoke billowed out around the mountains. My mind started racing. What's going on? Fire burning our precious town. No time to run back. No time to pack. Stay safe. Don't risk it. Minutes turned into hours. Hours turned into days. Days into weeks. Finally, smoke disappears, trees burnt, houses turned to ash, families grieving. We have to have hope because we will rise. We will rise like a phoenix and fly over our new beginning. And the next poet is Alison Luderman. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, all the organizers. Um, that was beautiful, Jacqueline. Um, my poem is called, I Lived in the Time of Great Fires. And I'm in the poem, I'm buying masks. But this was before COVID. I wrote it in like 2018 or 19. I don't remember which year, but it was before COVID. Um, on my way home from buying breathing masks at the medical supply store, I stop at Goodwill because it calms me to walk slowly up and down the rows, fingering rayon and cotton, silk and wool. Sky outside is white with some gray and brown mixed in like marled yarn for a sweater no one wants to wear. I have my new air filter mask over my face, which makes me look like a frowsy, anxious bank robber who's just stopped off to hunt for bargains on her way to a grand heist, which is how I feel about human life here on earth today. We are pulling it out of the cash box at gunpoint, the Arctic ice shelf breaking and melting, the last polar bears, the last tigers, last years of breathable climate, as if we were getting away with something we won't ever get away with. Once again, California's burning and every thought begins and ends with fire. It's primal, the animal need to seek shelter, though all the grass is kindling now, kindling the trees, even the sky seems swallowed in flame. I'd say I lived in the time of great fires, but what time comes after this is what I want to know, and who will be around to name it? Um, and the children's poem, the, chi the, the, the young person's poem that I want to read is by Leonardo Fusaro. He's in 10th grade, Pacific Community Charter High School, A Cause for Worry. Don't worry, child, it will be all right. The world is on fire with artificial light as smoke plunges countries into endless night, and some wonder who we should really fight. Don't worry, child, it will be okay. Even though chemicals turn the swaying grass gray. And while polar bears run and play, some wonder if they can even have one more day. Don't worry, child, you'll be just fine. Though we wonder why corporations continue to mine away at a planet once green with oak and pine. But now some wonder if we cross the line. There is cause to worry, child. It may not be all right. The forest blaze with a fire too bright. The haze of ash is clouding our air sight. And now we all wonder if we've killed ourselves with this flight. And the next poet is Mary Zeppa. Thank you, Allison. 
Um, and thank you, Molly, and everybody who has organized this. I worked with the Sacramento Poetry Center for decades, so I know how much work is involved in doing something like this. My poem, since my name starts with this last name starts with Z, is the last poem in the book. And it is Sonoma County Prestissimo, October 2017. Wildfire, hills, orchards, neighborhoods. Ten minutes, our block was gone. Cars melting, tires exploding, dogs, horses, goats on their own. Which way does the wind howl this morning? Is my sister's house in Santa Rosa still safe? And the fountain grove in, home away from home, where we drank a goodnight kiss in, in the bar before we laid our heads down. All week on Facebook, her family's marked safe. Their vans packed, they're ready to evacuate. Camping gear, important papers, one album of photos, one box of Christmas ornaments made when their grown son and daughter were small. In case we have to start over, she says, adjusting her particle mask. My sister's a very practical person. And the kid poem that I have is, um, if you want to look at it, I, I like to listen myself, but for those who, who want to follow along, it's on page 160, and it's by Ali Vandra, who's a ninth grader in Nevada Union High School in Grass Valley, or was when this was written. A letter from fire. Sorry, I came out of nowhere and destroyed everything. Like a typhoon against a stick house. I was just hungry. My hunger cannot be tamed, though. It's like the Yuba River in winter, rushing and rising over land, sweeping away anything in its wake. I want to be friends, but everything I touch turns to ash. I tried to warn you as my hunger ran wild. My bright red and orange lit up the sky like a warning siren going off. But still, I was too quick. No warning could ever prepare you for my destruction. The wind tried to knock me down, and the lakes and rivers tried to surround me, but they did not avail. My hunger dismisses them as a slight annoyance in the whole scheme of things, and ravages your home, your family. Sorry, I cannot do anything but watch, as if I were a fawn witnessing her mother hit by a car, unable to stop it, unable to move. Sorry. And the next reader is Molly Fisk. Who's been moving around the whole house trying to find better light. I'm gonna start with Marcus Wright's poem, My Old House. On page 167, he's a sixth grader or was two years ago. He's now an eighth grader someplace. He was at, at the James Monroe Elementary School in Sonoma County. My Old House. Come through the dark lane of cold air, like a ghost flowing through your bones. Look around at the huge tree looking down on you. Listen carefully for the sound of sobbing. Walk down the block until you see a park. Run up to the park to see if it's broken. Smell the rain falling in the midnight sky. Touch the rust on the monkey bars. You can make out a human figure of a boy. The boy is sitting on what used to be a crimson swing, looking at a house 10 feet away from the park. Hear the sobbing again, but it sounds close. You can see the boy crying by the shining tears falling down. And that boy misses his old house. And that boy is me. And this is particulate matter. If all you counted were tires on the cars left in driveways and stranded beside the roads, melted dashboards and taillights, oil pans, window glass, seatbelt clasps, the propane tanks in everyone's yards, though we didn't hear them explode, R13 insulation, paint inside and out, the liquor store's plastic letters in puddled colors below their charred sign, each man-made soul of every shoe in all those closets. 
the laundromat's washer's round metal doors. But then Arco, Safeway, Walgreens, the library, everything they contained. How many miles of electrical wire and PVC pipe swirling into the once blue sky? How many linoleum acres? Not to mention the valley oaks, the ponderosas, all the wild hearts and all the tame, their bark and leaves and hooves and hair and bones, their final cries, and our neighbors, so many particular, precious, irreplaceable lives that despite ourselves, we're inhaling. I'd like to welcome Paul Belts, who's gonna be reading from the other anthology, Fire and Rain, Eco-Poetry of California. Okay, thank you, Molly, and thank you to everybody who organized this. This is really a wonderful reading. Hi from Chico, where it's been quite hot, but both of the poems I'm going to read come from the coast. And the first one is mine. It's called Elephant Seal on the Beach from Point Reyes National Seashore. Baby, you weren't dying. You pulled your wrinkled body towards the sea, used your flippers, slid inch by inch with rapid shallow breaths and eyes that seemed to plead. You were one chord in Point Reyes crescendo, tone poem of wind slashed rock with sandy deer and skunk tracks. Foresters turned, plunged for anchovies, two oyster catchers zipped along the shore. Brown pelicans dipped and rose on waves, skimming breakers. Green anemones blossomed in tide pools, showed their jade tentacles. Everything flowed through this visual melody. You watched and heard all, still as a gale ripped cliff, worn out through with striving. No, baby, this wasn't your final solo. It was a rest, music's break. Next morning, you left a trail that merged with high tide. And the next one, I thought, considering everything that we are facing these days, I thought I would read one that was celebratory. This one comes, this one was written by Patty Jocelyn, who has lived in Mendocino County and in Vermont, and it's called I Live Here. I live here. I say to myself, I say it out loud. I live here. How to describe the smell of ocean air. Salt as white musk, seaweeds dusk as dark and wild. Is there a word for the ropes of glistening pearls snails leave behind on sidewalks cracked by flowers? Orange poppies clustered and splayed. Agates washed clean, sparkling for no reason. Magnificent tower of jewels rising above weathered fences. Here on the Mendocino coast, in a moment's time, fog knows how to lay itself down like a damp sheet. Soon the wind pushes the clouds aside. A radiant halo begins. I live here. I wonder if a thousand is too many times to say the same thing. I live here. Thanks, and our next reader is Lucille Lang Day. Myself, um, because it's spring, I thought I'd read a spring poem from the hills and canyons section of Fire and Rain. And the poem I'm going to read is on page 132. It's called Eye of the Beholder, and it starts with an epigraph. The symmetrical arrangement of variously shaped CT and the ornate sculpturing of their cuticle make many mites some of the most beautiful and spectacular of all animals. And that's Robert D. Barnes in Invertebrate Zoology. Scarlet pimpernels nod by a trail on Mount Diablo, flat stars glowing close to earth. 
Under a rotting log, slime mold also blooms red, a royal garden for the termite queen who'll charm her half pint king for years, each day laying thousands of eggs to be nurtured by workers and guarded by soldiers whose soft, slender bodies shine like pearls. Farther up, amid wild hyacinths, tiny blue vases with fluted necks floating on the frozen waves of the Franciscan formation, a black widow spider spins her web. Her legs are long and shapely, her body a marble, polished black, with a perfect orange-red hourglass on the belly, complete in herself, she'll eat her mate, savoring his juices. Under yellow wallflowers rising in tall grass, a wolf spider, hairy as a cat's ear, emerges from her nest to scout the earth with four pairs of eyes that glisten when sunlight strikes them. She drags a ball-shaped gray silk sack packed with eggs. Soon spiderlings will cover her back and she'll chase her prey, then pounce to feed the magnificent dress, her quivering little ones. Climbing past poison oak and muir pines, I emanate butyric acid, and to the small creatures of the forest and meadow, I must smell like a pot roast simmering in fine wine. A hungry baby finds me, a nymph of the western black-legged tick, which digs its toothed pinchers deep into my thigh and expands, a balloon filling with crimson liquid. And all the bacteria dance as they multiply in my blood. I am one with them, one with the tick, my epidermis a fragrant field flowering over hidden rivers, piquant, delicious. And our next po poet uh, is Maureen Epstein. I have two poems uh, from uh, Fire and Rain. The first one is Calypso Orchid. From a grove of firs on Woodstock Road, the goddess of hidden places, bright pink on her shiny stem, steps to the verge to greet me. Next day, orange traffic cones stood guard. Two trunks, trucks hunkered where the ladies stood, while workmen filled and dragged fir branches, grown too close to power lines. I could have yelled at them, but did not, knowing I was complicit in the ravages we humans undertake in the name of warmth and shelter. Today, I passed again and marked the truck wheel's muddy indentation. Less than an inch away, the orchard orchid huddled, battered, but preparing to set seed. Further in the duff, untouched, a sister blazed brilliant pink above her oval leaf. I paused and bowed my head acknowledging the grief I felt for being who I am. And now a, a fire poem, after fire. And this, this poem uh, commemorates uh, a very special grove of redwood trees uh, a few miles inland from here, uh, Montgomery Woods, which um, uh, was burned by fire some years ago. And this is four years later. <clears throat> Redwood Grove after fire. Crunch of black fragments underfoot. Faint whiff of char. Earth beside the trail fresh broken where a burned tree fell, as they sometimes do years later. Cave walls of the hollow giants gleam with fresh scorch. 
Ferns have returned to the flat. They're sparser now. More logs among them fallen. We celebrate survival. Redwood sorrel has spread its green salve over ashy ground. Warty and wrinkled, the old ones stand in their accustomed silence. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Diane Frank. Thank you. What a pleasure to read with all of you tonight and to hear your poems. I have two short poems inspired by the Mendocino woodlands. I think one of the best ways to bond with a place is to create memories there. I've spent a few weeks in the Mendocino woodlands over the years with a group of dancers and musicians. In the Mendocino woodlands, he walks into the forest where trees are burning, finding his path in the silence. Woodpecker, memory, larkspur in the night of burning. His eyes ask me to wait, to keep the connection inside the silent place where I find pebbles of intuition, rose quartz. In the morning, lupins on the trail to the cliff where the giant trillium blooms, kelp and seals swimming beyond the tide pools below. I run through Indian paintbrush, milkmaids, cinquefoil, climbing the path where he finds me. And what is love? A firewalk initiation from the ocean through a cathedral of trees. Fuchsia, wild grape, sudden blue streaks on the wing of a moth. Stellar's jay wanting to fly free. My second poem is Mendocino Late Night. After making love in the Mendocino woodlands late at night, walking home through a cathedral of redwood trees, a path I find in the dark. High branches, the shape of a rune, osprey lifting from the Gualala River, what the owl said, an echo of white deer running to the moon. Sometimes I feel you in the morning, silver koi under the water of my dream. Our next poet is Ruth Nolan. Good fire. When for so long, having subsisted on dry lightning, no tongue of rain, I will have traveled deeply deliberately into your long limb body to swallowed entire veins, carried you away in my deep pockets, ground you into dust, each withered pond, now its own haunted moon. After all else has been burned away, it is too dry for you to return here again, and a terrible thirst-free beauty will flourish here. Buckwheat, flaming aster, spine flower, bladder pod. And this poem is from my firefighting days, which I'm really glad I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I think the heat would kill me in like two minutes. Mopping up. And this is from Fire and Rain. It's the most unraveled and well-paying job I've ever had fighting fires in far-flung, lonely wilderness areas, all the way from the San Bernardino National Forest to the Panamint Mountains near Death Valley, the Southern Sierra in Yosemite, Trinity Alps, the San Gabriels looming above LA at night, like broken teeth. And most of the time, I was the only woman on the crew, cutting fire line and sucking down smoke, and after a fire had laid down across ravaged meadows and once beautiful forested slopes, our job was far from done. We'd hike in baked potato hot, ankle deep ash that blew eerily in the wind, like snakeskins. We'd finish off dying wildfires by stirring and cooling the molten detritus 
which we could not recognize, with shovels. We spray dribbles of water from fat bags that slosh like heavy vertigo on our backs. We call them piss pumps. We struggle to keep pace in the slow down underbelly. We burned up things and cherished if little known Golden State geographies with lonely names, Rattlesnake Mountain, Horse Thief Spring, Last Chance Range, Toro Peak. And above us, the whispered remains of once familiar trees, lurking black, tall and jagged, scary even, stripped of the dignity of their given names. Jeffrey Pine, Ponderosa, Western Sequoia, California Black Oak, now turned into something else. At our feet, the complete bequeathing of the latter fuels, buckwheat, Western juniper, coyote brush, poison oak. We could never be sure if a fire was completely out. That was the crazy thing. So we'd have to keep stirring ash and sifting through what had been scorched, watching each unearthed ember spark hot and red, then wish into its desperate last breath. Sometimes this could take weeks or long, long days. And this is what I remember most vividly from my firefighting days, the mopping up, the endless mopping up, making sure, trying to make sure the fire was put to bed and would not ignite again. We'd soothe the feverish brow of forsaken landscapes to cool them down and pray for rain. That, and I also remember how often the guys on the crew, including my future daughter's father, would ask me why I left behind the apron of my domesticity to flirt with flames, be out there on the fire line with all the guys, why I flirted with flames instead of with them. And our next reader is Barbara Quick. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, the poem I have in the collection is called Katati. All my life I've dreamed of tilling such soil, sandy loam that yields to the shovel as readily as powdered chocolate to the spoon, as receptive as the womb of a teenage girl, soil that wants to be impregnated with the seeds I want to grow. Genovese, basil, twining peas, and lettuce in a row. Soil that snuggles up against the roots of heirlooms, black crim and brandy wine. Drink of me, the soil says, cling to me. Wrap your legs around me early in the morning as the sun rises and the rooster crows and the birds start to sing. I'm going to read a short poem that's related from um, my little chapbook that was just published, The Light on Sifnos. The feeling of earth on my fingers. Sometimes I like to take the gloves off to pull the weeds and gather the harvest barehanded to remember this is earth, not dirt, to keep my body's memory fresh here where the roots twine down searching for sustenance, here where the worms create their magic, this will be my bed, a flower bed perhaps, a vegetable garden blushing with its own abundance. These plants, all of them, are wiser than I will ever be. They know how to drink the mist and make the most of every photon of sunlight and moonlight too, living ever in their moment of life. Praise the wisdom of the wanderers who kiss the earth at last returning home. Our next reader is the wonderful Patty Trimble. Good 
Thank you. Am I on now? Can you hear me? Yes. You see me? Um, I, I'm thinking of these, I'm going to read two poems from the collection, Fire and Rain. And I, um, I am surprised how innocent they are and how it was the beginning of my understanding that uh, saving wildernesses was not enough. And they're very personal. Above Isberg Pass. Each summer, I am voyager to the unknown meadow, high in wilderness, walking, sailing on that green beloved sea. My heart spins like a gyroscope along the wide view trail where river runs from cloud. I must go there in the fragile months to memorize the flowers as they hang from threads, blue columbine, cinquefoil, and the tiniest, tiniest of daisies. I have always thought the sky was trembling and the boulder shivering for the multitudes of gods in search of a home. But now I think they shake in fear of me as I see behind me deepening troughs and trails across this earth I meant to love. And this other poem I wrote after attending, ironically, Bioneers and staying in a hotel in, uh, on the land of the marsh that I used to walk around in when I was a kid, which is in San Rafael, near the Civic Center. San Rafael, California. In the 60s, two lane highways and wild valleys, we could walk most places then. And on the rise above this marsh, my sister caught a tiny mission blue. She opened up her hand a secret flew. I shoved a purple lupin close, made her breathe the scent of now. Today there are eight lanes, a nice hotel, banana trees, such industry. And vanishing the species of children walking railroad tracks in California fields. We who knew which butterflies will worship at a bloom. We demanding lupin overwhelm us, bitter and sweet. Thank you, and I believe I am the last reader. Yes, thank you very much, Patty. That does conclude tonight's reading. I think that um, you have stumped our uh, audience. There are no questions and answers. I did, however, want to leave you with a few thoughts. Molly quotes youth activist Greta Thunberg in the front matter to her anthology, I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. And so we express our heartfelt gratitude tonight to Molly, Lucille and Ruth and to all the readers for joining us to share your thoughts about loss and resilience. And of course we love our audience members uh, and our Marin Poetry Center members and our partner Mill Valley Library for making this all possible. Thank you again, I hope we meet again out uh, in the fields and forests and the ecosystems of California. Until then, everyone be well and have a good night.